What do I want you to know before an egg retrieval? Hi friends, I'm Dr. Natalie Crawford. I'm a board certified OBGYN and fertility doctor. And today I wanna to talk about a part of IVF. This is the egg retrieval. So what do I want you to know as you are preparing to undergo IVF and as you're getting ready for the egg retrieval, which in my experience is the most nerve wracking part of this process. If you like learning about your fertility and your body, please subscribe to the channel. This is how we can amplify and share my message about education and empowerment with more people. So if you're going through IVF, you definitely want to watch the first video I have on preparing for the IVF process and what I want you to know ahead of time. That's going to help set you off in the right track. But this video is a in-depth focus on what exactly happens during the egg retrieval, what I want you to know to be prepared for that particular step and for your recovery. So the egg retrieval is a vaginal oocyte retrieval or a transvaginal egg aspiration your clinic may call it different things. But essentially what we're doing is once the eggs grow inside the body, we are now going to get them out in this minimally invasive procedure. Interesting fun fact, this used to be done with surgery, like abdominal surgery. You would have to go to sleep, make incisions on the abdomen, and go in to get just the one egg that was available because we didn't have the medications to grow multiple eggs at one time, and we didn't have a way to get the eggs out that wasn't abdominal surgery. So IVF has come a long way. We're able to get multiple eggs at once and we're able to take them out of the body in this minimally invasive procedure. And that has changed the process for us all. So pretty cool. First of all, this should be done under anesthesia. I don't know anybody who does the process not under anesthesia. We use an anesthesiologist at Fora. So an anesthesia doctor comes in, you get an IV, you'll get a sedation medication called propofol. So this medication puts you to sleep, but you're still breathing on your own. You're not paralyzed. There's no breathing tube. So it's a very low risk anesthesia process. As we're setting up for the procedure, it should be done in some type of a sterile room environment, and it's usually attached to the IVF lab. So this may not be directly in your clinic. It may be next door to your clinic. It may be across town. Depends on the structure of your clinic. So that's a good question to ask as you're lining things up. Where does the egg retrieval take place? Just so you're prepared. Another good question is going to be, who does the egg retrieval? Now, you're going to have a doctor at a clinic, and that's who makes your plan. But is that the person who does the egg retrieval? Depends on the clinic structure, and clinics are different. We have a doctor of the day model, meaning the two of us are partners. This is a partner practice. So as soon as you enter into treatment, we're both going to take care of you, come up with a plan, and either of us may do the egg retrieval depending on the day. We make sure you meet that doctor ahead of time because you see doctors for monitoring, but clinics are different. So you might walk in and see a brand new face on the day of your egg retrieval, and I want you to be prepared for that. So who is going to do the egg retrieval? Are you going to meet this person ahead of time? Just what's the structure? Because that's important for you to be prepared. So where is it going to be and who is going to do it? So the room is attached to the IVF lab. The IVF lab is where all the magic happens. That's where the eggs will be identified. That's where they will be fertilized. If you're going on through IVF, the embryos will be grown, biopsied, etc. But this is a sterile procedure room, pretty much like an OR. What's going to happen is you'll roll into the room. Typically, you'll go to sleep. You'll go to sleep. You won't remember any part of the process. And we set up. So we set up for the sterile environment and we use the vaginal ultrasound probe. And what we do is we attach a needle guide. So the needle guide is allowing us to take a needle. It's a pretty long needle. So allowing us to take a needle and attach it to the ultrasound so we have exact direct knowledge of where that needle is going. And so we watch under ultrasound and you can enter into the follicles from the vagina. So if we think about the vagina, what happens is at the top of the vagina, remember it is not an indefinite space, you have the cervix and then next to the cervix is vaginal tissue that connects to the abdominal cavity. And when those ovaries grow, we always think about them as being next to the uterus, but when they get heavy filled with those follicles, they actually move and they get below the uterus and they really sit at the top of the vagina. In this picture, you can see these black circles, those are your follicles. Each follicle gets bigger as the egg gets more mature, and you can see the needle 
which is the bright white line entering into each follicle. And as we drain the follicle, it collapses. The fluid is entering through that needle and connected to an aspiration system. So the system connects a like vacuum suction pump into little test tubes. And so it is sucking the fluid out and then we are getting test tubes full of your eggs. Those test tubes are taken directly to the lab where an embryologist who is trained is doing oocyte identification. Most of us who are fertility doctors really like this process because whoever's in the lab is counting out the eggs and each follicle you're going into, you know if there should be a mature egg or not. So you're waiting for the count, one, two, three. But they're structuring and identifying the eggs and putting them into a separate dish. And so this process goes on and on until all the follicles are drained. Once they're all drained, everything will be inspected to see if there's any bleeding. You'll then be awoken from anesthesia and taken back to your recovery room. So a few things to note, not every egg that will be identified will be mature. We often will go into any follicle we see because general ranges for maturity, typically about a follicle size of 15 to 20 millimeters, it is actually a person-to-person -person measurement. So I have some patients who have mature eggs at smaller numbers and some who are mature at bigger numbers, but we'll go into every follicle we can safely to give them a chance and get the egg out. So you're going to get an egg number and then you're going to find out the number of mature eggs because some of those eggs may be degenerated, like overcooked. Some of them may be immature and some of them may be a germinal vesicle, very far from immaturity. So there's these different stages, GV, germinal vesicle, not mature at all, M1, completed meiosis one, close to maturity, but can't be fertilized. M2, fully mature, has completed meiosis two, and then a degenerated egg or potentially a post-mature or a damaged. So you'll find out how many M2s or mature eggs you have. Those are the ones that can be fertilized. So if you're undergoing ICSI, intracytoplasmic sperm injection, those will be the ones that have a sperm picked up and injected into them. If you're doing egg freezing, those will be the eggs that are frozen right away. And if you're doing conventional fertilization, they actually cannot identify which eggs are mature or not, because in order to do that, you have to take off the outer cells, which are called the cumulus cells, in order to see the mature component of the egg. That step is essential if you're doing ICSI. However, if you're doing conventional fertilization, just eggs in the dish and sperm on top, that sperm has to be able to swim into those eggs and attach and the cumulus cells are important. So if you're doing regular conventional fertilization, you're not gonna get that mature egg number. If you're doing ICSI or egg freezing, you definitely will because the cumulus cells are removed. Now, complications of the procedure. Overall, this is a very safe procedure, very safe, does not mean always safe because it is a needle going into your abdomen, there is anesthesia. So there are certain risks. There was a study published in 2018 in Fertility and Sterility looking at complications from egg retrievals. This was looking at over 20,000 egg retrievals, so a really large sample size. The complication rate was less than a half a percent per egg retrieval, so overall very rare. Intra-abdominal bleeding or a puncture of a small blood vessel or bleeding from the ovaries, it's sometimes hard to know, was the most common, but occurred two out of 1,000 cases, so very unlikely. Other potential complications, which were even lesser likely, were infection or anesthesia complications, and there were no long-lasting sequelae. Everybody recovered well. As far as what you feel like after the procedure, those ovaries are get drained, but in some patients, they actually fill up with blood because this is a needle poking to these follicles. So sometimes we get what we call refill or where the follicle was refills with blood. This means you may not have immediate relief of that pelvic pressure after the retrieval. You actually can sometimes still have pain, swelling, feeling really heavy in your abdomen, that can all be common because these ovaries are still very large. So I usually tell patients you're gonna feel crampy because of that sensation. Sometimes like a strong period cramps, even though there's no period, you definitely can have some spotting and bleeding afterward and no getting in bodies of water, like tubs, pools, lakes for at least two weeks after the egg retrieval because we wanna drop that infection risk. And because you have puncture marks inside your vagina, we want everything clean, also no sex, everything clean. So from there, I usually say, hey, prepare to not do heavy activity. You're not gonna feel your best. You're still gonna be bloated from the hormone levels. Heating pad can be amazing for the lower abdomen area. 
You do want to move around some. So walks are good, but you don't want to do high intensity exercise. Definitely nothing that would cause bouncing or get those ovaries to move around inside your body. And then because of the blood distribution, especially if you got a high egg count number, you potentially could be at risk for something called ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome or OHSS. OHSS is when the estrogen component got so high that some of the liquid from your blood migrates out of your blood vessels. And so you get this liquid in the abdomen called ascites, liquid in your lungs called pleural effusions. And this can cause you to be really bloated and uncomfortable. It can cause you to have trouble breathing. It also can lead to severe dehydration because the blood gets very thick. Any water you're intaking is going out and it can actually lead to kidney damage or like blood clots like DVTs or pulmonary emboli. So that's a severe complication. Most of the time we're able to mitigate that risk. OHSS occurs in less than 1% of patients because now we have better protocols to decrease the incidence. Not doing fresh transfers, changing the trigger, monitoring your estrogen levels, but some patients still get some of these symptoms. So you might get placed on medications after your retrieval to try to drop your estrogen down. You also might be encouraged to drink electrolyte-rich fluids like Pedialyte or Gatorade, or you may be craving salty foods. And this is where the rumor of like eating McDonald's french fries after an egg retrieval came to be because that salt was helping keep some of that water inside your blood vessels. That's really from an era back when we did fresh transfers and we didn't have all these mechanisms to decrease the chance of OHSS that we have now, but still that's where that old wife's tale comes from. Now, another thing to be aware of is your estrogen was probably like peak high for you when you went into the egg retrieval. We destroyed some of the cells that make these hormones and your estrogen is gonna drop pretty profoundly after the egg retrieval. I caution patients, this is when you're actually mood-wise going to feel your worst because you're going to have this drop in estrogen. You're, if you get PMS symptoms like cranky, irritable, that's going to happen. So be aware if you have your biggest presentation at work or a big trip or your best friend's wedding, you're going to be a little more emotional during that time frame. And it's a good time to clear some of your schedule, ask for extra support, or clue in some of your friends that this is what you're going through. By the time your period starts, which typically occurs about eight to 14 days after the egg retrieval, depending on your protocol, then things are going to start healing up even more and you're gonna to start to feel a little bit back to normal. I think it's always important to ask your care team what your plan is next. Are you doing multiple cycles? Are you going into a transfer? Does it depend on your results? Should you start birth control with your period? Are you having a follow-up? Is your doctor reaching out? There's no right or wrong, but knowing your next step is essential in order to navigate the IVF process best. I hope this video helped. We're going to do more what to expect at different points of the fertility process and procedures. I would love to answer any questions that you leave in the comments. As always, you can follow along on Instagram at Natalie Crawford MD or subscribe to the As A Woman Fertility Hormones and Beyond podcast so that you can learn about your own fertility and body. Thanks friends.